Thank you all for being here for our latest update on COVID-19, commonly known as coronavirus. The state, nation, and world learn more about this new virus every single day. And public health officials and governments across the country are working to put what we learn into action because our top priority is to protect our people. While most, more than 80%, who get this virus experience mild to moderate symptoms, we know some people, especially older Vermonters and those with serious health conditions like heart or lung disease and diabetes are at higher risk of becoming very sick. The best information we currently have from the experts concludes that slowing it down and preventing as many cases as possible is the best way to make sure the most vulnerable, the very ill and the elderly get the care they need, which in many cases will include hospitalization when they need it. Put more directly, this is more about protecting the vulnerable. And while many will either not get it or see mild symptoms, we all have to do our part to slow it down to protect the ill and older Vermonters who are at risk. This is the lesson from other countries like China and Italy where efforts to slow the spread were not implemented early enough and now we see them struggling. So today we're going to enact mitigation measures that will help slow the spread which means better health outcomes for those who get this virus. While Vermont only has two known cases at this time, we know it's just a matter of time before there are many more. I want Vermonters to know how very fortunate we are to have so many incredibly talented and hardworking people in the Department of Health and Vermont Emergency Management as well as first responders and health care providers across the state who have been working very hard to prepare for and respond to this virus and who will continue to serve as well. But as more information becomes available about how important community mitigation strategies are to slowing this, we must take more action to protect the ill and elderly. Every single one of us has an incredibly important role to play in this. We're all in this together. We're going to act together, and we're going to get through this together. That's why today I declared a state of emergency. And through these emergency powers, I'm implementing several additional mitigation strategies, which will be in effect until April 15th. Though that could be shortened or extended based on what we experience on the ground. Again, it's important to keep in mind this strategy is focused on protecting our most vulnerable, which based on science and data means the elderly and the very ill. Specifically, these actions are designed to prevent and control outbreaks, protect those at greatest risk, minimize the risks to the public, maintain the health and safety of Vermonters and to limit the strain on our health care system and to slow the spread of infection in our communities. First, to protect our older Vermonters, I've ordered long-term care facilities to restrict visitor access with exceptions for family visiting kids and terminally ill loved ones. I know this will be very difficult for everyone involved. But we also know the residents of these facilities and those seeking care at our hospitals are most at risk. And we must take short-term measures to protect them. Second, room or single space for social or recreational events. Now, I understand the disruption this will cause, as well as the economic impacts but we've seen its effectiveness in other countries, and we must do our part. Third, 
to limit and protect state employees and their communities. I've suspended all non-essential out-of-state travel for state business by state employees. The Secretary of Administration and Commissioner of Human Resources are also directed to encourage and facilitate more employees to work from home over the next month. And we encourage employers across the state to the, do the same if possible. My executive order also outlines additional steps to support the health department's work, including providing resources for, for the Department of Public Safety to assist with their, their contact tracing and investigative efforts directing the Department of Financial Regulation to analyze demographic information in order to know the potential impacts on our population, workforce, and economy, and more. Additional steps and details are outlined in the executive order. And while I know many are concerned about our pre-K through 12 schools, in close consultation with our team, especially our healthcare team, we have determined that closing schools at this point is not seen as effective, at least not yet. We believe keeping, keeping them in schools, rather than at home alone, or with their parents or grandparents who are at risk, is the best approach at this time. However, this is something the Department of Health, Emergency Management, and the Agency of Education are closely monitoring and re-evaluating -evalu every day. And we will not hesitate to act if the risks change. As a result, schools and parents should be preparing for this possibility. In closing, I want to thank this group and their teams behind me, as well as those across state and local government and in our health care system who are working long hours with a fierce commitment to serving and protecting Vermonters. I also, again, want to thank members of the press for the calm clarity you've helped us communicate to Vermonters. Your professionalism is greatly appreciated and much needed in these times. Finally, and most importantly, I want to thank all Vermonters for their understanding, cooperation, and action to help protect and support their own families, as well as care for their neighbors. Because stopping this virus is about protecting the very sick and elderly from its effects. As I've outlined, this is going to require some unique and, yes, disruptive measures. And we need everyone's help to make them as successful as possible. My fellow Vermonters, I know many are concerned and even scared. I also know some will think this is not enough, and others will think this is far too much. Please know every decision I make will be informed by the best science and the best experts we have available. And we are truly blessed to have some of the best professionals working with us. I also want to make, uh, make this very clear. We are going to get through this. Together, we will be united in our commitment to protect the very ill and elderly from this virus, and this will unite us in our actions. We will work together as a community to defeat it in the short term, so we emerge stronger and more resilient for the long term. There is no doubt. These are difficult steps that for a few weeks or possibly months will change what we do in our daily lives. And I also need you to know there may be more that may be necessary. But the compassion and commitment of our people and communities will see us through. We have to rise above frustrations and fear. We can't focus on how this may set us back because what it's really about is about who we are as Vermonters and how we're going to lead our state forward. Here's the bottom line. It's not in our DNA to turn our backs on the most vulnerable. We're going to face it, fight it, and we're going to win. And just like after Irene, 
We're all going to do our part to help each other at this time of need, to show our children how the calm, compassionate determination of Vermonters in our communities can meet any challenge. So with that, I'm now going to turn this over to Dr. Levine to share the latest on what we're seeing in Vermont, as well as what we know about this virus. Dr. Levine. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> and I also would like to thank the members of the Vermont media. In addition to your usual good work, you've been essential conduits of this important public health messaging to Vermonters. I know what you've heard today and over the past several weeks can be, frankly, overwhelming. I'd like to, in the next few moments, give you a brief status update, uh, tell a little more about the virus and some of the rationale from a public health standpoint for what you've just heard. As of earlier today, we still have only two cases. We are monitoring well over 200 Vermonters a number that is going to increase significantly related to our second case and to the fact that the CDC has added to its recommendations for travelers returning to the U.S. As of this week, people returning from most of Europe will be asked to stay home for 14 days and monitor their own health and report their travel to the health department. These are the same directions we've been giving the people coming from other areas with widespread, sustained transmission of COVID-19, including China, Iran, and South Korea. You can find the full list on our website, healthvermont.gov. To date, we've completed monitoring for almost 100 Vermonters. Prior to today, we had tested almost 140 Vermonters in 10 days. We're anticipating an additional 100 plus test results today. Based upon the experience of many other states and some of our adjoining states, we fully expect this number to increase. <clears throat> I'll tell you just one or two things we don't know so much about with this virus. How infectious is someone who has no symptoms? How infectious is someone and for how long does it last after their illness. But there are very important things that we do know. As I've said many times, 80% of those who contract this virus will have mild to moderate illness. The incubation period from the time one contract, uh, is with someone who has the virus is four to seven days. It can, though, be up to 14. Transmissibility is thought to be one person has the ability to infect two others. And then they, of course, have that same ability, which is why it's so important early on to try to contain the virus. The case fatality rate is 1% much more than seasonal flu, which is 0.1%, but much less than the human race's prior experience with novel coronaviruses like SARS or MERS. And the 1% is an average. The case fatality rate is far more uh, skewed toward the elderly and the chronically ill, those with underlying predisposing conditions that we're always telling you about. And we know the young are markedly less likely to show signs of infection. And that's why the focus of the strategy the governor has outlined is so directed to protecting our most vulnerable populations. We also know that the virus is transmitted by respiratory droplets and the distance is about six feet. And that is why, as you'll hear, social distancing strategies can become so important. We don't know how long the virus can persist on a surface, on something that's not alive. It's thought to be anywhere from seconds to minutes to maybe an hour. The public health and our state's response to this outbreak is a matter of using what data we have, anticipating what the future may hold, 
and the timing of our approaches. And if you think about it, our goals are quite straightforward. Protect the most vulnerable, protect as many people as possible from getting infected, knowing that many still will, as this is truly a novel virus for the human race. And prevent the healthcare system from becoming overwhelmed so it can deliver the best possible care to those in need and still retain a robust healthcare workforce. So I'm going to illustrate this with a picture because I think it's worth a, a thousand words and it'll speak why, about the measures the governor has addressed to help flatten this curve of potential spread of virus in Vermont. I'm a little tall for this. <laughs> Just for everyone's frame of reference, this axis is number of cases, and the horizontal axis is time. And for the sake of this discussion, the amount of time doesn't matter. We can call it weeks, we can call it months. If we look at the experience of earlier countries, when the virus took hold in the population, it had a very rapid expansion through the population. I'll call this a spike in the number of cases. Very dramatic rise, and seemingly as dramatic a fall after a period of time. If I could use our colleagues in Italy as an example, and they actually want me to use them as an example because they want the world to learn from their experience, this was a period of perhaps 10 days or two weeks, very rapid, in northern Italy. Our goal is to prevent such a rapid spike because this dotted horizontal line illustrates the capacity of our healthcare system to deal with this infection. If you overwhelm the capacity of the healthcare system, you run into problems with the healthcare workforce, with hospital beds, with ICU beds, with ventilators, everything. So as the term has been used, we want to flatten the curve. And that is this blue curve here. All of the measures that the governor has described are called mitigation measures. We are following in Vermont a parallel course, mitigation and containment. Containment is the work of all of the public health personnel following the Vermonters I've described and instructing others about what to do when they return from travel, etc. Mitigation are all the strategies you just heard uh, about how this may impact our daily lives in the coming weeks. It's believed that with these mitigation strategies, in effect, you flatten that curve, you may prolong the duration of the virus in the population, but the healthcare system can take care of everybody and not be extraordinarily stressed in an acute period of time. That's the whole purpose of what you've been hearing about, protecting as many people as possible over time. So what every one of us can do, and what we will do in our individual actions, will certainly matter when it comes to your health and the health of your loved ones, and especially how much we can limit the spread of germs and the impact of this pandemic in Vermont. It's important that everyone stay very informed of this fast-moving situation and take personal responsibility for following the Vermont and CDC recommendations and guidance. And as you've just heard, we're asking everyone to strictly follow new guidance and restrictions, which you can find regularly updated at the healthvermont.gov website. You've heard about hospitals and long-term care facility visitation policies. And obviously, no one wants to introduce an infection in those settings. And I think intuitively, Vermonters understand that they shouldn't be attending those places uh, in a state of illness, and that the less interaction the public has, the more likely we will have healthy populations that don't have a virus introduced. We want to help the individuals who are housed in these long-term care settings and hospitals, as well as the staff and workers. You've heard a lot about lab testing lately. 
And in order to identify people who are most at risk of illness, we're prioritizing lab testing. We've prioritized it for people with symptoms of disease, which we've told you include fever, cough, and shortness of breath as the most common symptoms. And we've encouraged individuals with those symptoms to call their health care provider, not to physically go to their office unless instructed to do so. And we've avoided testing people who do not have COVID-19 symptoms. On the horizon, in the very near future, the healthcare lab that has been doing all of the assays will be augmented by other labs who uh, uh, have been provided permission and certification to do this kind of testing as well. This is all very important work for what we call surveillance, so we can actually figure out where on this curve we are at a point in time and when certain strategies may need to be expanded. The governor's provided you with a lot of information about what in public health terms we call social distancing. Social distancing measures include these cancellations of mass gatherings, adjustments to the way we work. We all know how disruptive these things can be for, from our normal day-to-day -day life. It seems that the most controversial public health recommendations surround considerations for school closures. And I'd like to spend a moment on that topic. I'll say from the outset, we, like all other states, do rely heavily on the recommendations of the Centers for Disease Control, as well as the available science, the reports from other countries' experiences, and consultation with school health experts. And speaking of school closure, that should be viewed as part of a broader suite of community mitigation strategies, useful at a time when there is significant community spread of infection, meaning person-to-person -person spread without other risk factors. I'll be frank, much of this relies on mathematical modeling data, but it's not believed that very early in an outbreak, two-week short-duration closures can have an impact on the curve that I've shown you or on medical outcomes. The advice is to time such closures slightly later in community spread, but before that spike in the curve would occur, and that a longer than two week closure might be important at that time to be effective. Obviously, a longer closure would have significant implications for student academic support, for school-based meals and other services. And we must take into consideration something the governor mentioned, the really undesired or unanticipated consequences of initiating school closures early, such as removing a family member from their ability to generate income and be part of the workforce so, so that they can care for their children or having grandparents care for children, and they being the vulnerable population becoming ill from the virus. Thank you all for your attention. I'd like to now introduce our commissioner for the Department of Disability, Aging, and Independent Living, Monica Hutt. Good evening, everyone. What we know is that the population served by the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living both older Vermonters and Vermonters with disabilities who may have underlying health conditions are at higher risk for the COVID-19 infection. As the Department of Health has articulated so clearly, our primary goal is to slow the spread of COVID-19 and ensure that our health care systems can keep up with the demands for care to ensure the best outcomes for all Vermonters. Our focus at Dale remains on prevention. Because of the enhanced risk to those populations receiving long-term care, the governor has announced through this executive order an approach to limit the risk and exposure to the virus for those more vulnerable populations. By restricting visitors to long-term care facilities, carefully screening all individuals entering those facilities, and promoting strong prevention measures within facilities, we're doing all we can to keep vulnerable Vermonters and the staff that care for them safe. 
We realize that this response could be very distressing to family members and acknowledge that it may create some hardship. Please note that by doing this, we are prioritizing the health and safety of the people that you love. Dale has been working in lockstep with BDH in terms of guidance for long-term care, screening, and recommended protocols. Communication is critical to ensuring that facilities and entities serving vulnerable Vermonters have the information they need to provide good care, make good decisions, and adjust their practices according to the most up-to-date information and direction. We at Dale are pushing out all the information we receive from BDH and the Centers for Disease Control to all our long-term care providers. It's important to remember that in addition to facilities, we have vulnerable Vermonters receiving critical services in their own homes and communities across the state. It's important that all those providers that are offering services to vulnerable Vermonters have the information they need to keep themselves and others safe. So in addition to long-term care facilities, those networks receiving information from Dale include our designated agencies, area agencies on aging, home health agencies, adult day programs, senior centers, and meal sites. We are particularly grateful to the health department for all their work and for access to their expertise. Dr. Levine made himself available for a Q&A call with our long-term care facilities this week, and we'll be having the same kind of call with home health providers next week. We're posting the Q&A information on our website. We have a Dale staff person in the Health Operations Center starting on Monday full-time to represent the needs of older Vermonters and Vermonters with disabilities. Additionally, we're working diligently to answer questions as they come up. As information changes and strategies evolve, we're available to field calls and respond to questions, even if we need to consult with others to get the best information possible. In response to questions and concerns from our provider community, we're updating information and developing new guidance regularly. As we develop new guidance, it's available to all on that website. We are committed 100% to doing everything we can to ensure the health and safety of our most vulnerable Vermonters. We ask that everybody in Vermont join us in this effort. If you're sick, stay home. Forego in-person visits to friends and family members who may be vulnerable. Call or FaceTime them. Follow basic precautions and encourage others to do so. By taking personal responsibility for your actions, you can keep yourself safe and keep vulnerable Vermonters safe. Finally, I want to express my sincere gratitude to the thousands of long-term care staff and community providers on the ground right now taking care of our most vulnerable populations. They are doing extraordinary, critical work, and I can't express enough my admiration for their no-nonsense, common-sense approach to getting the job done and serving Vermonters. And now I'd like to introduce and ask to come forward um, Director Erica Borneman from Vermont Emergency Management. Good evening. The State Emergency Operations Center was activated on Wednesday at the, director, at the direction of Governor Scott to work closely with the Department of Health Operations Center to coordinate the response to what is now the COVID-19 pandemic. That work has involved uh, the implementation of community me mitigation measures just like these that we are announcing tonight. These new measures have built into our operations and we are working with agencies to ensure questions are answered uh, about that implementation. We are also working to communicate the details of the executive order to the public in a simple and effective way that's easy for everyone to understand. We communicated with emergency management directors and local officials today and will con continue to do so as these are implemented. We also are in regular communications with the first responders throughout Vermont and will continue to do so as well. The State Emergency Operations Center will be activated throughout the weekend and uh, until further notice to ensure these questions are answered and uh, provide further guidance as necessary. We continue to urge Vermonters to work with their local officials and emergency services and emergency management directors now and in the coming days and we will continue to work to support them and provide assistance from the spectrum of state government. Thank you. At this point, we'd uh, be happy to try and answer any questions you might have. Uh, Dr. Levine, you mentioned 
mention something about the second positive patient? Looks like a lot of information was going to come out of that case. Can you explain that a little bit? No, I wasn't saying information. I was saying um, the, no, the amount of contact tracing and the increase in the number of individuals in Vermont that we will be working closely with. You mean because of contact with patients? In that, yes, in that vein of thinking. Yeah. Sorry. Um, what will the sanctions look like for people that violate this restriction on gatherings? We are very confident that uh, everyone will adhere to this. I know we're a small community uh, in Vermont, and uh, we're hopeful uh, that they'll take uh, this as a measure to protect us in the long run. Um, I'm, I'm not sure there'll be a sanctions, but we will. Uh, provide the opportunity to uh, to educate them as to the policy, uh, and then uh, hope hope they do the right thing. And you said this applies to non-essential social and recreational gatherings. Is there going to be a more specific definition of what exactly that would include? Well, any gatherings with 250 people or more. Churches that have more than 200. Absolutely. Right. What about like base lodges? Well, again, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it would apply uh, to them as well. Uh, we are hoping uh, that they will, again, uh, produce some strategies that might uh, provide for that social isolation, uh, maybe on, uh, on their lifts and so forth. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, they wouldn't have to put four on a quad. Uh, they could put two. Um, they could limit the number of people uh, getting on the lift. Um, I think there are strategies that could be put into place, and we're hoping uh, that they will comply and help us with this. How do you define gatherings of over 250 when it comes to schools? gatherings over 250 kids in the hallway. Let me ask my question, please. If, and there are many other settings, cafeterias, in which more than 250 students will be present at one time. Uh, is any guidance being given to the schools about that sort of thing? Well, again, we're basing everything on the science, and uh, we're trying to determine how we can best uh, help the most vulnerable, the aging population, and we believe this is the right strategy. Obviously, this is uh, different. Uh, work settings and so forth are different than uh, recreational events and, uh, and social gatherings. So uh, a school is not considered a, a uh, social gathering uh, point, non-essential social uh, uh, gathering point. Could you say young people are, not, are at low risk for coronavirus, for COVID-19, serious illness, but they may well, because of that, be ideal carriers. Yep. Uh, is that taken into consideration? A absolutely. Everything is taken into consideration. That's why I had said uh, this could change. Uh, we don't know uh, how long this strategy uh, will be implemented. Uh, we, will, uh, we will take this uh, day, to, day by day. And as uh, Dr. Levine had, uh, had said, if we do this too early, it might not be helpful. Uh, and so. And, and as well, I mean, we have to consider uh, the kids themselves and where they're going. Not everyone uh, has a home to go to. Uh, some, uh, their, their most, uh, uh, the best environment for them uh, is the school. Uh, and that's where they get the most attention. That's where they get fed. Uh, and that's where they get uh, the most social interaction with their peers. Uh, otherwise, they go home. Uh, they could possibly go home to no one. Uh, and that wouldn't be a good situation either. So we have to balance this out and, again, understand uh, that we're flexible. Uh, we're going to watch the data. We're going to work with the uh, superintendents and communities. Uh, and to underscore, uh, if um, in, in the executive order as well, um, the school districts themselves uh, can close their schools. We will work with them if they feel it's necessary. We may, f may see that there's an outbreak in a certain area where we may need to uh, close the schools. And if a parent, and if a parent decides that they are not are no longer comfortable with their with their child being in the school, uh, we are uh, providing for um, them to uh, to take them out of school uh, without any repercussions uh, to the to the student, and provide for uh, any instruction we can uh, at that point. So we want to make sure that we're doing all we can to help them. At what point would the administration step in and say schools or schools in this area of the state have to close? How serious would the outbreak have to go? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, again, uh, we'll rely on the, uh, the data and the science, and, and uh, we're monitoring that daily, uh, as you know. Uh, some of the tracing uh, that we're doing uh, will lead us to that, possibly. 
uh, but, uh, but again, it's a very fluid situation and, and we'll be prepared to act uh, in a very quick fashion if, we, if it appears that it'd be beneficial to do so. Commissioner, you mentioned mathematical modeling. Have you seen any mathematical modeling that forecasts projected infection rates in Vermont? You know, it's interesting because uh, we have an aging demographic. I've talked about this a lot. Uh, I'm fearful um, that with our aging demographic that we may be uh, more vulnerable than other states. And that's why uh, I put these measures into place, uh, why I've asked uh, the Labor Department uh, as well as the Department of Financial Regulation, the commissioners involved, to do some modeling for us and let's do, uh, let's take the data and see where we're going with this uh, so we're fully prepared. Don't have that data at, at my disposal at this point. I know they've been working on it and whether they have it now or not, I'm not sure, but I haven't seen it yet. Has the, has the CDC provided any state level forecasting related to infection rates? No. What's the capacity of our hospital system to treat serious cases? How many ICU beds uh, do we have? How many are occupied right now? I mean, what's the capacity if this gets serious? Yeah, again, um, you might be able to, somebody else might be, the answer, uh, be able to answer this, but, uh, but that's some of the questions. Those are some of the questions that I had as well. Um, we want to collect, collect as much data as we can. Um, Sec uh, Secretary Smith. Today we have 236 available beds that we could do surge capacity at, another 50 onto that surge capacity to, to a r roughly around 283 beds. That's with no mitigation strategy, for example, doubling up size, not, no calling in other hospitals from out of state using other hospitals, just the capacity that we have today. And how many of those beds are full right now? Those beds are empty right now. How many uh, tests are being administered right now? How many positive, how many negative? Uh, we probably have the up-to-date data as of now. Do you have that, Dr. Levine? No, have it. Today we are testing at least 110 individual patients, uh, and those results are on the precipice of being reported out. And, and I said we've already tested in the short week to week and a half that the state could do testing because we were allowed to by the CDC, we've tested 140, the majority of which are negative. Um, and in addition, there were five Vermonters tested by New Hampshire related to the Dartmouth-Hitchcock episode uh, and positive case they had there, and all five Vermonters were negative. Governor, you said that uh, you thought, said in your remarks that uh, China, in China and Italy, the response was too slow and that helped the spread. Uh, I have heard on multiple occasions that basically the U.S. is on Italy's track, but two weeks behind yeah. Italy. Uh, does that mean that we have been too slow? Not necessarily yeah. just Vermont, but the whole country. Yeah, I think. Uh in some respects, we have to be honest with ourselves. So we are learning uh, more every day, uh, and we probably should have advanced earlier than this. But I, again, I would say Vermont uh, is, might be a little bit unique. We've had only two uh, positive uh, cases at this point in time, uh, and, uh, and so it hasn't hit us yet. Uh, but it's only a matter of time before it does, and we feel we're positioning ourselves uh, well uh, to, to mitigate this in the future. I'm going to have our Commissioner of uh, Labor uh, come forward, uh, Mike Harrington. Um, I thought it was important. I mean, obviously, uh, this could be a burden if we're asking people to stay home uh, for 14 days or they have uh, loved ones or, or family uh, that, where they have to take care of them. So uh, we wanted to find a way uh, to, uh, to accommodate them. We think we found a way with the legislature's help and uh, uh, Commissioner Harrington, maybe you could respond. Sure, thank you, Governor. Um, so I'll have you repeat the question just so I make sure I answer all parts uh, of it. Uh, there's a uh, component of this executive order yep. that authorizes some new allowances for the UI fund for workers who are affected by COVID-19. Can you yep. isolate exactly sure. what's going to be allowed now that was not previously yeah, so um, right now the, the biggest change or the biggest piece of information is that people um, who are impacted by this and told to self-isolate or to quarantine, they will be eligible for benefits. And so we will see that, we will treat that as a, temporarily, a temporary layoff and that for that isolation period, uh, they'll be eligible for benefits. 
Uh, that is the biggest piece right now um, that we will be putting into place uh, over the weekend and, and for next week. Uh, how is the state of emergency going to affect the uh, census, right? And next week, I believe it is, we start door-to-door -to -door, um, uh, polling. So. Yeah, that's a, a great question, and I don't have the answer to that at this point in time, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll have to contemplate that as we move forward. Obviously, the census is important. Um, but, uh, but we don't want to put people at risk either. What is your response to uh, Trump's emergency declaration today? Um, do you think it goes far enough, and how do we expect it to help us um, in terms of funding or otherwise? Yeah. Unfortunately, I did not see uh, his address. I did hear that there was a, a declaration. Uh, I think he made it at 3 or 4 o'clock, uh, but that's all I know about it. Uh, I will say I've been in uh, contact with Congressman Welch. Uh, he had hoped to be here tonight. Uh, to uh, to actually talk about the economic passage or economic package that they had hoped to pass today, uh, he texted me uh, before I came down and said he was not coming. They were on standby. They had not made a, a deal at this point, but he hoped uh, that it was going to uh, to be something that would be obviously positive for Vermont and our country. Um, so I'm um, I'm hoping as well uh, that they come to some agreement. Uh, for the uh, for the welfare of uh, of U.S. citizens. Up until now, the testing protocol probably question for Dr. Levine. The testing protocol has been if someone presents with symptoms that appear to be COVID-19, and a physician or a healthcare provider recommends a test, they are tested. Uh, has that protocol been expanded at all? It's been expanded in terms of. The original CDC guidance was only hospitalized patients, and we took that restriction away from the get-go and allowed people who are thinking they have the condition but are in their home and not requiring hospitalization to be tested. I, I have to say that um, you know, public health, one of its major uh, core duties is surveillance so that we know where we are on that curve. And our ability to do that is going to be very much expanded you know, in the next several days based on our testing capacity, based on capacity that gets expanded into the private sector and our major medical center can then perform as well. So I believe we'll have a lot more data and again, be very nimble with that data and be able to tell, do we have regional expansion? Do we have statewide expansion? Are we holding steady, you know, whatever the case, and make the decisions we need to make? But for now, the protocol has not been expanded. Right. It's not been expanded to someone who has no symptoms. Okay. Uh, I mean, in other countries, the countries that have been most effective at limiting the spread right. or mitigating the, the extent have done broad-based widespread testing, and we're not doing that. And I would make the we as a country rather than you single out the state. No, um, because that's, that's been the biggest criticism of the country at this point in time. As you point out, we don't want to have situations like happened in Italy happen here. And I think we're sort of at that pivot point right now where we can try to intervene in the testing protocol as well as in our knowledge about cases in the state and make better decisions. Would it be wise to expand the testing protocol to include in senior homes, people who work in senior homes, other highly at risk people out in Washington State, the major focus of an outbreak was in a senior residence. Right. I don't think we would do uh, just blind testing, though, of uh, places that have no reported cases, no reported illness. Um, I'd rather us be more strategic in that matter. But I do believe we have plenty of people who don't have symptoms who have had an exposure history. And I think we should continue to focus on that population because that population may be the canary in the mine, so to speak, that will help us understand how rapidly or not rapidly this virus may take hold within our borders or within the country in general. We used to hear from some people who have had some symptoms, you know, um, are sort of being able to sit tight. Um, so I guess, is the availability of tests an issue the availability of tests has not prevented us from testing appropriate people. And I think just the fact that 110 are being tested today is testimony to that. 
that far surpasses any day that we've had yet to date. Um, we've made sure to make this a clinical judgment of the clinician that the patient has been connected with. So I can't speak to uh, what would happen at that juncture. Doesn't that add a lot of uh, subjectivity to it, though? But I mean, it would seem that it might be good well, to take the subjectivity out from the local level. Yeah, no, I think it's objectivity, to be honest. I think a physician armed with the knowledge of what their patient is complaining about, what they know about their patient's history, and what they know about their risk factor history for this virus uh, provides tremendous objectivity, and we rely on their clinical judgment in that case. Has the testing capacity or testing protocols but the only way it has is if people have absolutely zero symptoms. But I mean, if you had significantly more capacity to test people tomorrow, would you begin testing more people than you are right now? I, I don't believe the 110 involves a lot of people who were denied the opportunity to be tested today. The, the, the question is, if you had yeah. significantly more testing capacity, would you be testing more people? We would be testing people who we judged were appropriate for testing, just like we are now. And they're, you know, they are presenting to the healthcare system as opposed to the health department. And we are relying on the clinical judgment of the clinician if, with our guidance. If people can be asymptomatic for 4 or 14 days before they mm -hmm. start exhibiting symptoms, if they exhibit symptoms, mm -hmm. then waiting until they're sick is, seems to me, inadequate. Understood. Understood. You know, I've, I've thought a lot about this as well, and uh, we never know when we become uh, infected. Uh, we could test someone every single day, uh, and they could still get infected the next day uh, with one doorknob, let's say, or coming uh, in contact with someone who has it. So um, it would be, it would stress the system, uh, we have to, again, prioritize. Uh, we don't have an unlimited number of tests. Uh, if we did, uh, maybe we would test more, but we don't. Uh, and we have to be honest about that, that we have, uh, we're doing all we can at this point in time. We're monitoring uh, the number of tests we have available. We're hoping to, to get more in the future. We've heard uh, from the federal government that they're producing more. Um, so we want to make sure that we keep up with what we're doing uh, today first. Uh, but there are some talks uh, about uh, private uh, companies coming forward with accelerated tests, and if they can do that and, and uh, we can get them in Vermont, I'm sure uh, that some people would like to rule that out uh, in, uh, in terms of whether they have it or not. But again, I would stress that that could change from day to day. Any data points yet that you can look to that will allow you to begin to quantify the economic well, again, we're, that's what I've tasked uh, our Department of Financial Regulation, uh, Mr. Okay. Pichek, uh, with uh, to trying to work with others, uh, labor and, and tax and so forth, to de try and determine what this is going to mean to us. Uh, because we know if we can get the numbers and the data, and uh, it's just math at that point, and uh, at least have an idea. But w I don't know at this point. We just talked about this about uh, 8.30 or 9 last night uh, at a meeting and uh, task them with that at that point. So I don't think we've come to any conclusions, but we hope to uh, very soon. And that way we can go and make the case of the, uh, to the federal delegation about what our needs, what we think our needs would be, uh, which might be uh, typical of others or maybe maybe not, but, uh, but we'll come up with something that, uh, that makes sense. As it relates to financial resources being put toward COVID-19, it looks like the only thing in this emergency order, just based on a brief, brief scan, is reallocation of resources at EPS to assist with contract tracing at the Department of Health. Yeah, are we, there any other new spending or reallocation measures that you are planning as part of Yeah, system? we're going to have to reassess uh, daily. I mean, we're, we're keeping track. We did get some, uh, some money, federal money as well, that's been uh, um, uh, pass on to us uh, here in Vermont, but we know that's not going to be enough, uh, so we have to continue to assess the need. Uh, but we're okay right now, uh, and again, working with the, uh, the legislature, they've, uh, they've been willing to, to do whatever they can to help and assist along the way. So between the federal delegation and the, the legislative delegation, 
uh, we'll figure this out, but we have to have the math first. We have to figure out what our needs are um, before we move forward. But uh, uh, suffice it to say uh, that we know uh, this will grow and this is going to have an effect on our economy here in Vermont. We're uh, hearing about a shortage of uh, personal protective equipment for healthcare providers, masks, gloves, that sort of thing. Um, I guess where are our stockpiles right now, sort of number wise, and what's being done about that? Yeah. Um, Erica. Can I speak to that? So, uh, the State Emergency Operations Center has been working closely with the Health Operations Center to inventory our state uh, statewide cache of masks and, and personal protective equipment. Um, so, we do have an understanding of that. Uh, the Department of Health has also submitted uh, an additional request to the, the Strategic National Stockpile for additional PPE, um, and we're still waiting to hear about the timing on the delivery of that. Um, and still working on the, the prioritization of that uh, personal protective equipment. How much are we requesting from the... Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me because that, that's, uh, that, that's coming uh, pretty quickly. So. What happens if and when critical members of the COVID-19 response team put together contracting themselves? Well, again, uh, we'll continue to reassess as uh, time moves on. Uh, that's why it's uh, critical we do all we can uh, first to put into place mitigation efforts. Uh, but we know it could impact our, our workforce. Uh, we already have a shortage in our workforce, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and certainly amongst our staff and, and so forth. Uh, we have, um, we have uh, continu uh, um, continuity of operations plans in place uh, for every department and agency. Uh, so we'll, we'll put those into place and, and act upon them as necessary. That would be a, uh, a hospital. Uh, no. Say no change. <clears throat> Dr. Brum said said there has been no change. There have been pictures going around of empty grocery shelves, people buying large quantities of essentials. Um, how much of a concern is that, particularly in some rural areas where they may only have a country store and a Dollar General to buy groceries from? Yeah, the the hoarding that I'm seeing uh, and the panic that's ensuing is concerning to me. And I think we all have to, to think about what our real needs are. Uh, if you look out, uh, you know, we, we hear a lot of people wanting to stockpile. And there's certain products, I don't understand why they're stockpiling, but they are. Um, if we look out over what your needs are over the next three to four weeks, that's all you need to have uh, at your disposal at this point in time. Uh, we have a very compassionate uh, state. Uh, and uh, we come together and, and give when, uh, when it's needed. And, uh, and I would hope uh, that Vermonters would, uh, would not try to stockpile things they don't need that others do need. So let's keep in mind uh, that we're one community. And, uh, but I am concerned about that. But I'm, I've been told uh, that uh, they will be restocking and there are more products coming. But this isn't, you know, this is unusual to, or, or this is uh, not uncommon across the country. We're seeing it everywhere. At what point are state agencies and state employees going to be working remotely? Um, if you know if that is at all, is that at all in consideration? And if so, why would that take effect? Yeah, I mean we've. Uh, uh, Suzanne uh, might be able to talk about this, uh, Secretary uh, Young, uh, but uh, we're asking that they work with the agencies, and departments, uh, to put together a plan uh, and. And, and move uh, forward on this. Would you be able to elaborate on this? Uh, sure, Governor. Uh, at your direction, we have worked with uh, the Department of Human Resources uh, to put two things in place today. One is a, um, a ban on non-essential out-of-state travel, uh, and the other is to encourage teleworking. We already have a telework policy for the state of Vermont employees. What we are hoping to do is um, be a little more generous with that, be a little more aggressive with that, so we can start to um, lower the volume of, of uh, state employees in some of our office buildings to the extent that we can. So uh, we are putting out some telework guidelines and working with our human resource managers and our cabinet to encourage that as an option. The state house is uh, a well-known petri dish. Uh, we, we just sent all of them home, many of them in high risk groups, and all of them back home throughout the state. Was there any consideration given to testing members of the legislature before they left? 
Well, I don't think, you know, with all due respect, uh, that they're any more special than any other Vermonter. Um, and, I, and I know that they might be at risk, but there are others that are at risk as well. And, um, and no one that I know of asked for a test or was experiencing any of the conditions that would warrant a test. Uh, I share your evaluation of their specialness, but um, they are a unique group in that they are dispersed to all parts of the state from a central location that's known to be an incubator of disease. Um, isn't, regardless of their specialness, isn't that a concern? Uh, again, I'm not sure that I, I, I've heard of anyone uh, that had experienced any of the con conditions or symptoms that would warrant a test. And if they had, uh, they could have um, come forward and we would have tested. Lawmakers are, of course, working on a package of bills which would be like a short-term economic fix for uh, COVID-19. Um, I guess, what's the role of your administration sort of in those talks and how are you working with lawmakers? Yeah, we're, we're trying to work hand in hand with them. Uh, obviously, they want to help, uh, and we would like their uh, expertise. We may need them in certain cases, uh, but we're waiting again uh, for the economic package from the federal government. What this means with their declaration, uh, if they're successful with the uh, with the House, and, and I'm not sure about the Senate at that uh, that point. Uh, but I'm not sure what their economic package is either. Um, at this point in time, uh, we are okay. Um, certainly, uh, we're fluid. Uh, we uh, we, we uh, our um, our budget is is good. Um, we're, we're still getting revenue in. We're fine. Um, it's much like uh, consider this like Irene. Uh, when uh, when Irene hit, uh, we were able to take advantage of uh, a lot of federal money in the months and years uh, to come. I would imagine that this is like our Irene, uh, and we'll be able to uh, to make it through uh, initially. But we'll need some federal help. Uh, in the in the coming months, but I don't want to do anything uh, legislatively uh, that would uh, would hurt uh, in terms of uh, the federal package. And then I guess if we do see some sort of shortfall of revenue or some sort of hit on uh, the state's budget, um, I guess where would that money come from? Or you know, would there be cuts in human services? Or sort of what would that look like? Yeah, it may be all of the above. Um, certainly, uh, we would uh, we would be heavily involved in that. Uh, we, uh, we'd have to prepare for that, but uh, we have the ability to do so. Looking at the uh, timeline of updates uh, come from you, know, you or uh, Dr. Levine, um, your, your last press conference was on Sunday, now we're Friday. I know it'll take time for some of this data to come in, but how is the process in terms of transparency uh, going to work between uh, the administration, the health department, letting the public know about Yeah, uh, I, I'm sure you've been to healthvermont.gov, uh, uh, gives up-to-date information every single day. Uh, and that's, uh, that's been distributed on a daily basis. Uh, that's your best resource at this point in time. If you have any questions about that, uh, any Vermonter should go to that website because it answers a lot of questions and it gives all the up-to-date information that we would have. Um, but if there's more information you need, obviously, uh, you also, we're just a phone call away. Is there a need for more frequent briefings? Um, as needed, um, I would say as needed, uh, we will provide them. So, so just to clarify, as this data comes in, it will be put out. It, it already is. Sorry, uh, it's online every day. Yeah. Yeah, it has been for quite some time. Uh, earlier you mentioned that we might be turning to private companies to sort of administer some of these tests or go through the results. What sort of vetting are these companies yeah. going to I, th This is on a, on a federal level, and I know that there are some large companies that uh, I think in New York, I, I've heard uh, that there are companies that are coming forward. They'd have to be approved by the... Um, CDC or someone, FDA, FDA uh, and uh, before they're put into use. But I've heard of them. I don't know, have any details about them. Anything else uh, you can add, offer with that? Dr. Brumstead offered earlier that uh, the Mayo Clinic is going to be contracted with the medical center to provide testing. And they appear to have capacity, meaning sufficient testing materials, kits, reagents, etc., to do the testing. So we'll have at least two sites then, the public health lab and the uh, medical center uh, lab. Have you basically been depending on or following the guidance of the federal government? And uh, is that good enough? I mean, the government, the federal government response has come in for a lot of criticism. Yeah, so as I said, uh, the minute we were allowed to do testing, we said, 
restricting that to our only hospitalized population doesn't really allow us to do our public health surveillance function and get a handle on where is this virus in our population. So we change that immediately. Um, so I don't want to say the federal guidance is poor because the federal guidance has been excellent from the CDC. However, uh, we've been able to be independent as well and come to strategic decisions that make sense for the state. Have you consulted outside experts? You know, there are a lot of good people at UVM, for instance. Actually, we work very closely with a lot of people at UVM. And um, I'm at the point now where I'm having once to twice weekly phone calls with many kinds of audiences, which include many people who are quite knowledgeable. Has there been any discussions about the wrong prisons, prison population, and the Secretary Smith. Sure, there has. There's been great focus uh, with the Vermont prisons, including uh, various issues dealing with supplies and social distancing. For example, today we've instituted uh, video vi visitation to make sure that uh, that the um, the people that are coming to our prisons are segregated from our prison population. We also are, as you probably know, when a prisoner is uh, comes into our custody, there is a screening process that take, takes place. Now that screening process has been expanded to include the questions dealing with COVID-19 as we move forward. We've also increased our supply chain in terms of uh, days on hand, in terms of food, medical supplies, uh, other supplies in, in there as well. And we've been having daily uh, conference calls with the commissioner as well as his, his superintendents on anything else that we can do as we move forward. My, my sister happens to be on the board of a small town library. And she told me that they are having trouble getting cleaning supplies because of the general depletion. Um, is anything being done to provide supplies to not just state agencies, not just public entities like schools, but also other places where the public gathers. Yeah, um, I had uh, I had the same thought when I started seeing all the uh, empty shelves on uh, on the news, and so um, I was concerned. I've asked uh, what this uh, this declaration, the state declaration, emergency declaration, would do. Uh, whether that would free up any resources from let's say, any federal institutions that might have stockpiles of certain products. Um, so I haven't received the answer back on that, but I've asked the question. Understanding the effort here is partially trying to make sure the healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed. Has there been any thought put into what would happen if, that, if hospitals do start to fill up any you know, places to put additional patients or yeah. traditional health care? Yeah, I, and I will let others speak to this, but there is a... Uh, emergency plan uh, that uh, can be implemented if that happens. And uh, and probably Dr. Bronstead could really speak to this, um, being won't. from a <laughs> being from a hospital. But um, all the hospitals have medical surge plans, uh, and a part of that is can things like canceling elective surgeries um, and and non-essential procedures to make room for more critical patients. Um, and it's really the medical surge uh, system in the state is a tiered surge approach um, where hospitals have plans for surge within their walls or even without their walls. And then there are other surge sites in a real catastrophic event uh, that we would have to bring in some additional assistance to run. Uh, but there are sites identified for that as well. Thanks, that's a great answer. Um, what I'll add is there's another piece of this for us, and that's um, the people capacity to take care of anybody that needs our services. So we've done a lot of work to uh, uh, make sure that we have uh, alternative staffing plans, that we can have sharing of staff among the hospitals, and I just heard today that normally for our physicians, they go three deep for an on-call um, uh, schedule so that if the first two people go down, you've got a third, we've gone four deep. So we're really obviously taking this incredibly seriously and working with, uh, uh, with the state to make sure that we have the capacity. Obviously the best thing is 
uh, as Dr. Levine and the governor have said, to make sure that we blunt that, uh, that curve. So if we've got uh, the course of travel recommendations from, from Europe, but what about from areas within the U.S. that have higher cases of COVID-19 in Florida, New York, Pennsylvania? Is there any sort of uh, recommendation there? Well, certainly uh, what we're doing with the non-essential travel uh, for state employees is something to, to keep that in mind uh, and uh, recognize that there uh, may be some coming in from other states. Uh, it's not just from other countries or where people have been before they get to the other states. Um, so um, that's why we implemented that uh, uh, that uh, pr uh, procedure, and uh, and we're hoping uh, that uh, businesses will follow suit as well, uh, because anything we can do to reduce and restrict this uh, will be better off in the long run. Considering that some European countries have much less of a problem, some have more of a problem. Why the entire country? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we're we're seeing it in. Uh, in the United States thus far as well, there are some states uh, who, have no, who don't have any cases that we know of uh, and many uh, that have had uh, outbreaks. So uh, we'll probably won't know why until much, much later. Uh, right now, it's just to really take care of the problem so at hand. In, in doing the, the travel self-quarantining from people traveling from back from Europe, that's based on President Trump's action? Yes, I mean, it's... And the Centers for Disease Control right. using data okay. uh, tells us that... Doesn't include Great Britain? Well, that was the president's decision. So it doesn't include Great Britain? No. Your, your, your quarantine advice doesn't include travelers coming back from Great Britain? I don't know that for a fact. I'd have to look at the map to see. Because his the president's directive had to do with travel to the countries. Um, what we use is travelers coming home from those countries. Well, he enacted a travel ban, I understand. partial travel ban for the entire continent except for Great Britain. Right. Um, <clears throat> is your quarantine, you know, asking people what? to self-quarantine uh, for 14 days after coming back from Europe, is that based on the president's so, <clears throat> directive? We are, anytime someone is now coming back from Europe, we are notified through a special CDC program called EPIX that that traveler is about to arrive in Vermont so we can initiate a uh, conversation with them and understand what their needs are and uh, what they should do in terms of their day-to-day -day existence. So uh, we're relying on that totally to know that they've arrived here and what to do. So. So I'm presuming explain. what we're getting is science-based because it's on the CDC's program. It's not politically biased information. Which gets back to his question, which is, you know, travelers who come back to Vermont from Washington State or Florida may be a higher risk than travelers coming back from France. Um, but we're not doing anything about people flying back from Co Seattle. Correct. Or Correct. Okay. As a country. I'll, uh, I'll take one more question. Yeah, I just wanted to check uh, our neighbor to the north, um, Quebec, also just announced a uh, state of emergency there. I was just curious if uh, being such an important trade partner as well as a lot of um, traffic in between Vermont and Quebec, uh, has there been contact with uh, the, the Quebec Prime Minister? I, I have not uh, had any contact with him at this point. All right. There was a situation earlier today on St. George Road in Williston, um, people outside in hazmat suits. So I was just looking to see if the Department of Health responded to that at all. Was the Department of Health there? I have no idea. It's nothing that I've heard anything about. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate you all coming in. Thank you.